Dear Bella, thanks a lot for coming and accepting our invitation to, to be present here. And before I give you more, I will just answer for uh, just briefly to the colleagues who uh, will have a chance to meet you. Uh, Bella Stoyanova uh, is uh, uh, assistant professor at the Department of Political Science, Nazarek University in Brno, in Czechia. And uh, uh, she is actually working at the, at the university in which she uh, uh, did also her PhD in 2006. Uh, before that, she uh, uh, did her MA in 2002 at Political Science uh, uh, Department of European Studies uh, uh, at Palatsky University. She's teaching uh, uh, several issues which are covering quite a huge uh, uh, area several of the areas which are really very interesting. Uh, uh, Cross-cultural negotiation conflict management, regional security in the Balkans and in Latin America, uh, then again uh, uh, populism in the Balkans and in Latin America as well. Uh, she's dealing beside, as you saw actually, uh, she, she is uh, uh, the expert for populist uh, extremist parties and so on, but she also has uh, her engagement, I had just briefly to mention, with the Balkans that have been lasting for quite a long, and she's really seen and perceived as one of the most important experts nowadays for the party policy, politics in the Balkans. Uh, she has at her uh, 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 site at CV, you could, you could find a very huge and, and uh, substantive list of her uh, publications that are covering all these areas. And I will just briefly mention two of the books. Uh, okay, please. And uh, which she's very famous for. Uh, that's how I found out, actually. Uh, a very well known book, The uh, uh, Far Right in the Balkans, published for the first time uh, by Manchester uh, University Press in 2013. And I think the last year was the second edition of the book, if I, if I saw that. And uh, uh, the book that she uh, wrote with Peter Emerson, Party Politics in the Western Balkans, uh, published by Rutledge, Rutledge in 2010. Uh, so actually, uh, she's uh, uh, coming from time to time to Balkans to, to do some researches on different areas. And now the reason that she is uh, here is actually that she's been participating in the security, Belgian security forum that will be held from uh, uh, Wednesday up to Friday. So we got a chance really uh, in the package somehow to use the presence of Vera here and to, I asked her to do a lecture uh, on uh, this very interesting issue as you will see because the, unfortunately we don't follow too much what's going on in Bishop countries although it's, it's very interesting for us. So I will not take more uh, uh, time and please, Vera, thank you very much uh, for, for coming and please, for is your Thank you, you were very kind to me, I have to say. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I should be dealing today with the populist, radical, extremist political, in, uh, political parties in the Shirat countries. As I heard, there are some people from the Slovak embassy here, so I'm not probably maybe telling something new to you, but you can correct me then, I mean, maybe telling your stance uh, about Slovakia. Um, so, uh, the outline of the presentation, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the terminology and the concept conceptualization, right? So, to start something, something scientific. Uh, then I will tell something who is who, right? Which parties I'm going to talk about. And then what do these parties talk about? What's their communication repertoire? What's their topics? And how these topics are treated by the other parties, by the competing parties. And how they are treated by the media topics of the far right parties. And then a little bit about the public discourse and some, some kind of concluding remarks. Uh, so the conceptual, par conceptual remarks. Uh, so which parties I'm going to talk about that? I quite like um, the conceptualization, uh, the German one, which they basically say uh, there is a democratic center and um, on the right and left hand side there is a right radicalism and left radicalism. And these are all operating within the constitutional framework. Whereas at the end of the axis, there is extremist parties, so there is extremism, uh, either left or right. And, and these are not operating within the constitutional framework. So these are the parties which are usually banned 
right? So that they have to be outlawed, so they are not operating within the constitution. And because I think it's needed to have some kind of common concept, because those parties are kind of fluid, they don't have the same identity, their identity is changing, and the topics are changing. They, they, can't, they can be like moving from the end to the center, or from the center to the, to the, to the end, right? So, so I think there, there is a, a need to have some kind of umbrella concept. And I use the umbrella concept as a far right. I mean, some researchers, they might not like the concept or the term, but I quite like that there, there should be some umbrella for the extremist parties and the radical right parties. Um, as regarding the um, conceptualization, I, I like the books which are done by Kasmude. And in, in his first book, he basically said that the uh, radical right parties, they encompass nationalism, uh, xenophobia, um, um, strong state, and also welfare chauvinism, right? And um, he revised a little bit this concept, or he said he, he wants to have some kind of narrow, more narrow definition, right? Not to have four features, but to put it maybe two more. And then he adds something. And he said, okay, it's, we operate with nativism. And nativism is in terms of internal homogenization, right? So you either kill the people, or you turn them to be your identity, or you, you just do something with them. Or in terms of uh, external territorialization, so in terms of making greater Serbia, Bulgaria, Albania, whatever. So that's nativism. Then you need um, authoritarian tendencies. So you need a strong state, right? Let's get rid of the lesbians, uh, all of the parasites, homosexuals, whoever, right? So, or death penalty, right? They usually uh, have death penalty in their programs. And last but not least, he added uh, populism. It's you know it's tricky, right? Populism, how to how to define that? But he basically says he doesn't want to talk about populism only in terms of strategies of the po of the political parties. But he says it's not only strategy; it's also ideology. And this ideology is uh, basically reflected in this division us and them, right? the goodies and the baddies. The good politicians on behalf, or on behalf of the good people, uh, sorry, the good people versus the bad politicians, right? So you set up a political party basically claiming we are the good ones, we are, you know, on behalf, operating on behalf of the people against the bloody, corrupted politicians, right, against the bellies. So this is, he, that's what he claims, this is the ideology. And he says it's, it's not, this populist concept is kind of illiberal because it's already dividing the society, polarizing society <coughs> between two, um, between two uh, poles. Um, so who is who? Um, I'll be talking about extremist parties. In case of uh, Hungary, it's Mie, which is not that much successful now. I'll be talking about Kotleba's party, uh, so Olesenese in terms of Slovakia, and maybe a Jobbik, which used to be extremist um, party. Uh, nowadays, he's a bit softening the ideology, the, the, the populist, the, the rhetoric, so he's moving more to the center. So I would rather put your big now to radical parties rather than extremist parties. And I'm going to be talking about the Czech Don, uh, Slovak National Party, uh, Polish, uh, League of Polish Families, Samobrana, so self-defense, and then populist, put Fidesz, uh, then a Czech League Party, Don, Ano, uh, Olano, and Polish PIS and Kutis 15. Uh, most successful parties are populist parties. So we see that the nationalists, so the far-right parties, are not very successful in these countries. <clears throat> if you look at them, the far-right parties uh, have usually around 10%. Most successful is Slovak National Party, which has been there for a long time. They, they were in the parliament, they have been in the, in the government. But, so it's, it's Slovak National Party and also Jovic in a long term. The others, it's usually like one uh, party for one political term, and that's it, and, and they are not uh, successful anymore. Sometimes the populist parties which add nationalism to, to their ideology, 
they are more successful. Whereas the extreme parties, if they soften, they are more successful as well, which we'll see in the presentation. If you look at the Czech far right, so the extremist and uh, radical right parties, it's an unsuccessful story. We don't have any far right parties actually, or not successful. There are, there are actually now three political parties which are kind of um, uh, relevant as they have been in the parliament or they are in the parliament. The first one is the Republicans. Uh, the biggest amount of votes they got is 8% in 1996. And then since 1998 they are not parliamentary party. Then we have Dawn. This party was, uh, was set up in 2013 before the parliamentary elections and they got 6% of the vote. And the Dawn split internally in 2015 into SPD party, which is now in the parliament as well, this, this kind of split branch. Right? So basically we have three parties which are relevant, but they are not, I mean, 6%, what, what is that, right? Or 8% in the 90s, nothing really. Why is that? Uh, we don't have a major group that would feel forgotten or under threat in the Czech Republic. The number of anti-system parties is quite high. Uh, we have a 5% electoral threshold, which hinders the new parties to enter the parliament. And historically, these parties, they, they have not attracted a large number of adherents. The entire establishment niche in the Czech party system is already occupied by the communists. We call the, com the Czech communists, they are not really international communists, as all of the communists, but there are a national patriotic communist party. And um, they have consistently failed to come up with a comparing program. Uh, what is very important for the Czech Republic, we are a very ethnically homogeneous party, right? We expelled everyone whom we could expel, we break with everyone whom we could break with. <coughs> uh, so we expelled 21% of the population in 1945-46, right? 21% of the population ethnic Germans were expelled after the Second World War. And since then we are completely ethnically homogeneous, right? No big national minorities, you know, no big boys. Uh, the only national minorities is gypsy minority, but they're kind of tiny minority and Vietnamese minority, and then some tiny ones, right? So, but it's not, not nothing big really. And I also argue that what is why we don't have a relevant far right party is that the their topics, topics of the far right parties are exploited by the other players. That the mainstream parties or the other competing political parties are exploiting the far right topics. Um, if you look at their topics then, um, obviously they are entire Roma, right? The gypsies are the parasites. Uh, they used to have anti-Vietnamese rhetoric as well because we have a quite compact Vietnamese uh, community in the Czech Republic. Um, they add also these authoritarian tendencies, so death penalty, right? Punitive measures against the homeless. Uh, they also had in their program in the 90s preserving 1919 borders of Czechoslovakia, including both Slovakia and Carpathian Ruthania. Nevertheless, this is not really considered, considered as native, is because they wanted to have it in a federal manner, like you know, respecting the Slovaks and respecting the Ukrainians and Ruthanians, and to have a kind of federal or confederal model. Um, big issue in the 90s in Czech Republic was Spanish decrease and anti-German sentiment. Because in the Václav Havel, the first president of the Czech Republic, he said, well, you know, we expelled them, we took their property, we nationalized them, we should do something about it, we should say sorry about it. And Václav Havel said, well, sorry, Germans, we did it, right? And the, other, the whole political spectrum was like, no, we don't want to say sorry to the bloody Germans, you know. Uh, they were the baddies, we are the goodies, you know, we are, we are the victims. And um, so the far right, they said, uh, they started to deal with the topics, and the whole political spectrum started to deal with the topic. And none of the political parties wanted to say, sorry, sorry Germans, we expelled you and we took your property. And it was the whole issue with the, uh, with the Czech German Declaration, which was then signed in 1997, and all, all around this. Um, the party now, uh, it's anti EU, anti NATO, and now obviously the migrants. And what they say now, a better gypsy than an incomer, right? So they are slowly moving to the hot topic uh, because the gypsy, no one is really considered about the gypsies, right? Um, the second party, which is now important because we will have elections in a month, uh, it's the Dawn party of the SPD, the split from the Dawn. 
and their repertoire. Um, at first, they started as a purely populist uh, player, purely populist, right? The body politicians, we want direct democracy, uh, we want referendums, um, uh, and, and we want these, these instruments of, of direct democracy, self-accountability uh, of the politicians, etc. And because of the refugee crisis, they started to target Islam. They started to target Angela Merkel for her welcoming um, policy. And advocating a nationalist state and sovereignty as the remedy of the crisis. Um, Czech political, Czech, Czech far right, they never adopt anti Semitic or anti LGBT agenda. It's just not an issue in, in Czech Republic uh, because obviously we don't have any Jews uh, and we are very, um, what to say, we're not really Catholic, <laughs> we are very atheist. <laughs> So we don't really uh, have this issue like um, uh, euthanasia, uh, LGBT, and uh, I don't know, abortions, etc. So it's not on the agenda. Um, now let's talk about the other parties uh, in the Czech Republic. So as I said, the Banish decrees and the Czech-German declaration was the first like thing, first issue of the far-right party which was adopted by the whole political spectrum. And virtually all political players were anti-German and were, were stirring anti-German fields, the body Germans, right? Um, and the second issue which was adopted by the whole political spectrum was the migration crisis. Now if you look at the whole political spectrum, um, all, virtually all of the political players, except of two parties, there are, in a sense, anti-migrants, nationalists, or xenophobic. The whole political spectrum. Even the Social Democratic Party, they're kind of shilly shilly. On one hand, they're saying, okay, we might accept some refugees, they're not that bad, okay. But on the other hand, their Minister of Interior, he's com using com completely nationalist and xenophobic rhetoric. Uh, and it's the same, not only for the Social Democrats, it's the same for the uh, Christian Democratic Party. Uh, their local leader, he is very anti-Gypsy and moved the whole Gypsy community out of the town. Uh, it's also the ODS, so the Conservative Party. The, the leader, actually he is the ex-rector of my university, right? Political scientist. Um, and uh, so I, I very much admire this guy because he's my ex-boss, but I really feel sorry for what he is doing right now. Uh, and um, and he's using this na nativist rhetoric as well before the elections. And um, this legitimization of nationalism at the highest level of government and politics has been reflected on the lower level of, of political hierarchy as well. And the local leaders uh, in like um, forgotten regions, they use it against the Romas because they're at the local level, it's the Romas who are, who are the issue. So they use it against, they use the anti-Roma rhetoric. Um, the, basically, the top statesmen, which diffused far-right topics in the Czech Republic, were Alois Zeman and Václav Klaus, so the uh, current uh, Czech president and ex-prime minister and, and the ex-president uh, and ex-prime minister. And both of them, they, in a sense, use the nationalist topics. Um, I want to move closer to our great president of the Czech Republic, Donald Zeman, who is really using populist techniques, uh, who is really saying, I am here on behalf of the good people against the body politicians. I am the people. I am supporting the working class. And he is completely against uh, the immigration and completely against presenting Muslims um, as a threat and the people around him, uh, like the, the guy next to him on the first photo, is like a, the leader of very extremist formation. Uh, and they stand next to each other, basically saying, President is supporting extremist person, whose party was banned, it was outlawed by, 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 by the judiciary. Right? Um, the public discourse. Uh, this legitimization of nationalism and xenophobia is, is already seen, is seen in, a, in a public discourse, so in the rise of xenophobia, in 
within the population. And there are many uh, formations uh, in the Czech Republic which uh, adopt nationalism and xenophobia. It's, it's this guy which I talked about, this Martin Kondic, uh, this one. He's actually um, from academia, he's from Bohemian University, and he's researching butterflies, right? So this guy who's researching butterflies, he set up many political formations, and all of them, there are anti-Muslims. We don't want even one Muslim in, in the Czech Republic because they are the threat. Uh, what he actually did uh, also, a kind of, we call it a performance, uh, he, uh, he brought a camel on the main square in Prague, on the Wenceslav Square, and on, on these camels he put some people who were like uh, dressed up as Arabic people with Kalashnikovs. Can you imagine uh, what, what you know, doing this right in the center of Europe? And he said it was a performance, right, a theater right, for the people. And obviously, you know, you can imagine what really happened there. Um, so this is the guy who's searching the butterflies. Um, there are obviously other formations, like alternative for the Czech Republic, it's the, similar to the alternative for um, the alternative for, for Deutschland, um, so alternative for German, for Czech Republic. There are also angry mothers. Uh, these angry mothers, um, they started with the mother issues, like uh, the right to deliver the baby at home and breastfeeding, and then uh, inclusion of mentally handicapped children at, at home, at, at schools. Uh, but then they started to adopt this nationalist rhetoric as well. We want to have safe home for our children uh, against the threat of, of the Muslims, right? And it's also seen in the in the mainstream pop music. Before that, uh, the nationalism was part of the neo-Nazi subculture. Before it was just a subculture somewhere, just a group of the people, you know, uh, use this nationalism in their songs. And now it's infiltrating into pop culture is mainstream and you have uh, singers and, and the bands which are on a TV or something and they're getting uh, some prizes and they are completely openly nationalistic. Um, so far right in the Czech Republic. The Czech political parties have a long tradition of promoting the Czech nationhood. So in fact it's been promoted by virtually every relevant political party in the contemporary political media. And this nationalism is being misused and appropriated and legitimized by the top government leaders. And this legitimization also led to the marginalization of the far right. I mean, besides, besides the other topics which I talked about in the beginning, right? Um, so, the day to day use of discriminatory, exclusionary, xenophobic speech by Czech leaders is reflected in media accounts that transmit the message that. These neg negative stereotypes are normal, right? That they are ca casual, and ultimately that they are not neutral, right? And, and this serves to reproduce the prejudices, uh, and the result is the intolerant public discourse. So as it stands, the Czech Republic will have not a, a far right party, but nationalism in xenophobia is quite widespread in all of the political players. Now we come to Slovakia. Uh, so the uh, Far right parties would be the Slovakian uh, National Party. Not, not such kind of the most the Slovakian National Party. Uh, becoming um, actually that they were the main player throughout the whole 20 last 20 years in the far right politics. Uh, and now recently they have uh, and they are softening actually. They are very much softening, moving more to the democratic center. And recently they have a new player called the Bas Party, the LSNS, uh, the People's Party of, of uh, Slovakia, I don't know what the translation would be. Uh, and this party, uh, what we observe uh, is the admiration to the Second World War formations, strong anti Semitism and anti Zeganism, um, anti EU, anti NATO. Actually, it's kind of interesting how many Jews are in Slovakia. I'm not sure about precise numbers. It will be quite similar to the situation in the Czech Republic. Not, not many, many, right. There are, there are I mean, it's, it, it shouldn't be an issue at all, but this part of they still tend to speak about it. And not so much as uh, some other issues like Muslims, like uh, 
gypsies, let's say, but still it can be presented a discussion of the same faith yeah. with that they mention the Jews from time to time. Yeah, so basically you have no Jews in the country and you still use the anti-Semitic cup, you know, for some reason. And <clears throat> from time to time uh, there is this debate about the, the good heterosexuals versus the ill homosexual, homosexuals and then uh, obviously the immigrants, right? We will not accept, we will accept not even one immigrant from Lakia, it's not Africa, we refuse to do national suicide, we refuse to play dances. Um, so the other competing parties, um, the parties from time to time, they, they use uh, pragmatic nationalism from time to time, uh, depends, right? But I think now so Lakia is, is more trying to stick maybe to the European Union, to stick with the EU, uh, with the EU mode. Um, so uh, there's kind of like pragmatic nationalism in some parties. Um, there's the SAS party, put the immigrants on the military boat and send them back home as the great amount of migrants means less freedom for our citizens. As the Mohammed is a key figure in Islam, Jesus is a key figure in Christianity, however Jesus spread Christianity with the word, Mohammed with the sword, it's a quote from the leader of the SAS party. Um, so basically all main competing players play with slight pragmatic nationalism and nevertheless, as I said now, it's kind of turning back to, the, to, to stick with the hard core of the EU, so they said, okay, yes, we will accept the migrants, but you can maybe go on with this, about the, the contemporary policy of Slovakia. Uh, uh, sorry, just uh, uh, speaking about the Baltics in uh, Slovakia, what, what is uh, their uh, result or success of the elections? How many votes do they get? Of whom? Uh, Slovakia. The far right party? Yeah. Uh, well, the SNS, they are now in the government, yeah, still, and then it's the LSNS party, which. Uh, uh, they, I think they were outlawed now, or they are in the process of being banned? Well, they are sitting in the parliament. Um, their result of last elections was about 8%. It was a great surprise for all the people in Slovakia, because during the pre-election polls, most of the people were rather afraid of admitting that they would vote for the far-right party, so they expected to get like 2-3%. to It was a huge surprise coming out with 8% of the votes. There's a process that was initiated by the main prosecutor of the Soviet Republic to get it outlawed, but uh, well, it will be hard to do since, firstly, we don't know how long this process could take, and secondly, they could always transform the party to another one, just to change the name. And you know, the public support won't decrease just because you outlaw a party. It might mean vice versa, that actually they will become artists for some part of the public and then receive them all that. Now, what might be quite crucial will be the local elections. Uh, this will take place in maybe two weeks or so. Uh, and they've got a leader in the... Well, we've got a, Slovakia has got a bit different administration than Serbia. It's similar to Croatians, these Banovinas. And we've got a leader in central Slovakia from this far-right party, and he's uh, going for his second term. So we'll see if he's able to defend the second term, that will be quite successful the party. But according to the polls, he should lose. So, yeah, we'll see. But they are sitting in the parliament. And the, the first party, the SNS, uh, it was quite a big difference in comparison with the situation in the past, where really they've got a leader with really strong uh, anti Semitic, anti Gypsy, anti Muslim, anti everything proclamations and rhetoric. Now they're quite moderate because they realize yeah, they're that. They're in the government, right? So they have to, you know. They've got a new leader, and he probably realized that this. This retreat won't bring any success to the party. So basically, the voters that were on the far right moved to, move move to, to the, 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 the other side. SNS have uh, how many votes did they get uh, at last elections? I don't remember the precise number, but. Uh, I think I got the precise number. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just it's, uh, in the first one. I would say 12. Yeah, some, something like that. Uh, to the left? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so no, yeah. Oh, yeah, something like that. Sure. Yeah.
Okay, thank you. Uh, so the Polish far right, let's move to Poland. Uh, a league of Polish families of uh, Pearl. Um, they are kind of became, becoming marginal. Uh, they are what they use, they use Euroscepticism, national and Christian narrative. They focus on the national values against the ill Europe and usually there are these typical uh, issues for Poland, this national Christianity, this typical Polish national, so abortion is a very important topic, LGBT agenda, very important topic, uh, euthanasia, very important topic, so this kind of, this is very, very like issue for, for the Polish far right. Um, and the competing, are competing parties, so it's the PIS, uh, it's clearly mainstreaming nationalism, then PSL, Conservative Party, and and then there are uh, modern parties, pro-European liberal and cookies, Eurosceptic, populists of nationalists and the opposition, but uh, PO, uh, they oppose the nationalism, but they are the kind of discredited opposition, right? Um, they have a, a guy who's representing them in the uh, European Parliament, uh, Janusz korbin uh, This he's probably the most famous Poland, Polish guy now, and he was several times suspended and fined from the European Parliament for Nazi salute, harsh nationalism, referring to migrants as human garbage, and also denigration of women. Um, Hungarian far right. Um, it's Mayev. Uh, however, Mayev is now kind of marginal party, and they still obviously would like to have the big Hungary, right, to revise its to get the, the Hungary the big borders. Um, so th there is this kind of revisionism. Also anti-Semitism is here. Anti-Roma, um, anti-EU, anti-NATO. Nevertheless, the is not really relevant now. It's, it's Jobbik, which is relevant. And Jobbik also, like uh, Serbia, uh, Serbia, the Slovakian National Party, also moved more to the center and also softened the, the rhetoric. And uh, with this softening of the rhetoric, they are actually uh, increasing their votes, right? Mm -hmm. So the same situation like in Slovakia, right? So before then, they talked about also about uh, revisionism, right? So let's make a Hungary big, big borders, right? Uh, and now they are becoming all kind of mainstream parties, and it's also tied to the uh, Orban, right? The, the uh, Fidesz is appropri appropriated nationalism, so they are kind of like merging together, like moving. To, uh, and, and so these, the boundaries between them are kind of blurring, right, between the democratic center and between the far right parties, right. And besides Fidesz, we have the discredited opposition, uh, the Socialist Party rejecting nationalism, and the Greek Party uh, is also in opposition, so not really relevant, and the PP Party is discredited. And I put the, here the quote of the scholar Heller, and you know this is the lines between discourses of moderate right and radical right politics have been blurring. As the boundaries become more and more porous, the languages of right-wing radicalism become more and more unaccepted in Hungary. And basically this is happening also in the Czech Republic. And uh, partially it is also happening, it's also happening also in Poland, right? And maybe it's also happening in Slovakia in a sense, right? That you have this, that the moderate right is kind of, and we now don't know what is really radical right, because the democratic center is really using the nationalist card. And before then we defined uh, radical right in you know, nationalism, so I said, how do we want to define now this family right, of political parties? Um, media, how do they refer uh, and shape the public discourse? How do they refer to the far right parties? Um, there is Berlusconization of the media. In the Czech Republic, the uh, main media outlets are in the hands of the uh, Ex-Minister of Finances, Andrei Babiš, who is the who will have elections in a month, and then he will unfortunately become um, the um, the winner of the elections. Uh, it seems like that. We'll see. Uh, and no one knows what's going to happen after the elections. And he basically owns main media outlets. He owns the television also, and and some and some radio stations. So there, um, the Berlusconization of the media is also seen in in Hungary. Where Orban kind of kind of like controls some of the media or have put, put his people right there. Um, how
how do they refer to the far right? It's uh, either negative framing, if they talk about the extremist ones, so the extremist one they, I don't know, like make an art so many right, to the extremist ones, when, uh, or they are neutral uh, in, in the framing, or I mean, sort of the leader of the uh, uh, SMS party in the 90s was really negatively framed, like the mad lunatic person, right, really a mad guy, the same slab, slab, uh, slavic, but they are kind of, they are kind of mad. It's not really about portraying them as, as being chromatic. Um, Yubik is framed as persona non, non grata. Uh, so, so the radical right narrative appears in the Hungarian media, but the radical right politicians and parties are treated as persona non grata or the Hungarian media space, which basically is the situation in all the countries. How do media refer to their topics? Um, the newspapers or the research about the comparison of Western European uh, newspapers and Eastern European newspapers show that the newspapers in Western Europe are more compassionate towards the plight of refugees, whereas the uh, Eastern European newspapers are more like they're more like um, <coughs> presenting the refugees as a threat, right? As a muffling threat, a threat for the society. And uh, also the, uh, the Romas are presented in negative and stereotypical and prejudiced way. Right? Um, or they do avoid showing images of women, of children, or there was a case of the reminded Czech Republic, they just completely disinterpreted what the refugees said and completely portrayed them in a manner like uh, which was not right at all. They you know so some kind of concluding remarks. Uh, so the lines between the discourses of, of moderate right and radical right politics have been blurring in, in, in all of these countries. And there is a rise of populist formation which use nationalist path. Um, there is something what I call demonization, according to our president, uh, because it's mainstream of nationalism and xenophobia. He's a Czech president and he is clearly mainstreaming. Uh, and supporting nationalism and, and xenophobia. Um, there is a marginalization of the far right in Czech Republic and Poland. There is still in Slovakia and there is still Hungary. But I mean, you have, uh, you have the Hungarians, you have all these issues, right, relations with Hungary, and the uh, double citizenship issue, and all these things uh, you can you know, tackle. We don't have anything we can really tackle right now except of the migrants. Um, there is a verbal scanization, so my media in the hands of the politicians. There is also a criminalization, which I didn't really, haven't really touched in, in the presentation. So there, are, um, there is a huge trend in pro-Russian campaigns. There is a lot of websites being set up now in the whole Vishagra. Uh, no one knows who, who they have, whom they have the money from, but usually the, the traces go to Russia. They're like pro-Russian, anti uh, EU, uh, and there are using this post factual uh, trend, right? Really not using the facts, but uh, you know, really um, lying and, and misinterpreting the reality. And there are many of them, obviously, now when you have the web, the internet, and everyone uses the internet, so that's a big threat also, and a big thing. In the, in, 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 in the Czech Republic and in all, all, all of Vyshegra. We do have urbanization, so we do have dismantling of democracy in, in Poland and in Hungary. Um, and uh, there is a polarization of the society and politics, right? Um, so I uh, very much like the um, conceptualization of populism done by Mexican political scientists. Aditi, who says populism can be like a guest who comes late and drunk to this dinner, doesn't respect the manners, but spells out the painful troubles of the group. Right? So I would like to conclude that maybe in Hungary and Poland, it seems that the guest disrupted, not only disrupted the party, but launched a new party under new rules, and uh, polarizing so the society uh, who is half of it who is supporting the new guest and, and half of it who is against him. Whereas Slovakia and Czech Republic is not the case yet, which we only have to, to, the one who is like spreading out the troubles things. I mean, Slovakia seems to be now 
be behaving. Uh, in the Czech Republic, um, well, we have elections in, in, um, within a month. And as I said, the, uh, the headliner or the expected winner is Andrei Babiš, the populist leader, and no one knows what's going to happen after the elections because he's kind of, you know, he, he, he is misusing the situation and you don't know, he doesn't have some kind of coherent ideology at all. The only ideology of his is populism. Me, I'm the one who have, who I have my own firm. I'm, I'm, I want to do a state as a firm, and uh, I'm supporting the working people against the bloody politicians. And the bloody politicians are only talking, 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 and that's it. So no one knows what's going to happen after the elections uh, in the Czech Republic. Okay, thank you.
nationalist and he basically says he wants to reject it. It's a conservative party and he's really he's really mad with the class of Georgia in, in this sense. And they have very yes to to they always have to have you know. Free for them, 
and we basically all of the uh, like we treat them equally as the Czech citizens, right? So the the, the Czech laws are we treat them completely the same as with the pensions, wages, and everything, right? So there's not so there's a huge mass like in community. So, so. And to the second uh, question. Um, um, Czechia was introduced by, by Miller Zeman. He made it a kind of agenda to put it that he wants to have a, uh, the name Czechia. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't really like it to be honest, and I, I still haven't uh, uh, got used to it. Right? So it, the, the official name of the republic is Czech Republic, right? Whereas in the UN it should be called Czechia. But uh, I, I still, you know, I'm not really. So the Czech Republic is the constitutional name, right? The constitutional name is the Czech Republic. Česko. Česko. Česká republika. Česká republika. Hungary has transformed itself to a uh, major side, not republic anymore, after the change of the constitution. So they are the only ones who has like no republic in its Like in Czech. I, I quite like the term Česko because if, if before then people quite talked about Czechy, but Czechy means only Bohemia, right? Whereas Česko should incorporate also Moravia and Silesia, right? So if you if you say Bohemia, so Czechy, you are not really talking about Moravians and Silesia. We have our national languages as well, right? Or <laughs> our ethnic different ethnicities, right? But we are the Czechs. I mean, the Moravians or some might not be Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Can you give us an explanation why most of those who are red parties are against the NATO and the EU? What are their arguments? Why are they against the NATO? Um, well, EU, they're nationalists, right? So it's the, at first, yeah, I'm sure. They must have some arguments why they're against the NATO. Well, first of all, I. It's sort of like table why they take too much money to make what, what are the reasons why they are in the uh, First of all, they are nationalist in sense. So, at first place, they are Czech or Slovak or Polish. So, EU is some kind of comes multicultural project. But Lithuanians are also Lithuanians and they are not anti NATO. So, okay. that's why I asked or Polish, or Polish, or very strongly. Uh, yeah, Poland, Poland is different, right? Yeah. Poland is because they. they Their nationalism is different than the. Yeah, Czech the, it's, yeah it's different. In Poland, they have, to, they have to support NATO, right? And I mean, with NATO, it was. Uh, I mean, when, when NATO bombarded Yugoslavia, there was a big, um, uh, big issue in, in the, within the Czech politicians, right? And, and there was a big. Like, sh how. I mean, we, we just entered NATO, and then, like, 20 days after that, uh, there was a war, and we entered a, a NATO because we wanted to live in peace. We thought if we enter a NATO, they will, we will be living in a peace. Whereas after I don't know ten days or something, there was a NATO doing the humanitarian campaign on on, on, on uh, Serbia. So um, there was big debate about this as well. Uh, not only uh, not only Kosovo issue and, and the others, right? So it's. It's too much not democratic for them, and they want to have the direct control of our people, of our ethnicity. And you're giving up your power, you know. More. Whereas Poland is different. You are, you have to, you know, because there's this, the, the Russian bear to, to close and to, and the history, right? Moving of Poland. I don't. Uh, <coughs> okay, I have a couple of, 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 of issues. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, theoretically speaking, I, I strongly support your uh, idea of uh, uh, putting the far right as a kind of a realm because you know there, there was also quite a huge discussion out there in the West among the scholars how to define what is really happening, really, and uh, let me say general far right or right. Uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, it's uh, uh, because our media, for example, are, uh, are putting everything uh, like to the you know like extreme. So I think that using of uh, uh, a radical right is very useful because what we have, especially in uh, in, in West now, is five, six, the most leading or controversial, let me say, from 
Austria, FBO to uh, IFD. I, we, we had the polemics last, last year here at, uh, uh, at our tribuna. How could you define that? Because I think that they are also uh, uh, trying to mainstream themselves in the sense, so I can't really put them at the extreme right in many ways. So I think that this is a very good way to approach the general scene to try, although it is also very hard, I mean from the, uh, I don't know, center right to a radical right up to extreme right, but at least you could start doing something, which is, I think, very good. But generally, uh, I would like you to, to comment more upon that as a, as a first issue, because uh, uh, the, the problem is that you have uh, Orban and Kaczynski who are still members of EPP, which should be kind of classical center right, the appropriate to the Bank of America, and all of them. And on the other hand, they are really, as, as you put it, uh, 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 right mainstreaming in some parts. So generally, would you agree that the West, Western political space was mostly left mainstreaming in, in some kind of way in, in the last couple of years, moving before this new rise of the radical challenge? And uh, that actually, or, or in this regard, you have a uh, right, right thing that the whole spectrum is more or less moving into the, the, the right uh, 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 stream, if, if I could say. Would you agree with that? That um, in the West, that it's like more to the, to the uh, left? And yeah, I mean, in the sense that you have, for example, CDU yeah, yeah. moving more and more to the, let me say, uh, yeah. Central leftist agenda in many ways. Yeah, and some yeah, people yeah. think that the reason why I gave ah. it so much was that they simply entered, like yeah. from Gola, who used to be a member of CDU and now he thinks that they betrayed the kind of. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. I think it's also uh, tied to, to the uh, like building a new state. I mean, Germans, they build their own state, you know, far away. and and it's like the Czech Republic started to be in 1993, so it's like trying to this building of Czech national identity and Slovak national identity. So, so starting from the scratch, and that's why you tie the politics to the, to the nationalism, to, the, to building this kind of national identity thing. Right? So that's why I think, I think, it's, it's, we are not really sure about Poland and, and Hungary, uh, but I mean, the, it's the historical issue also. So. Yeah, I have to do this, yes. Okay, yeah. I, I think because it's theoretically really, really interesting yeah. debate, it's been open like how to define Yeah, the then how do you define democratic centre if they're with yeah. nationalism? And how do you then define what is right if they, so how, you know, so that we are completely lost now because we, yeah, we lost our definitions and our conceptualization. It's, it's a big challenge, so I, I, I think that the, the way in which you are going on is, is pretty useful, I think. Mean, having the, the, the in mind all the problems that we may uh, face nowadays. Uh, second issue is the one that uh, uh, Sabine started with this uh, uh, criminalization in some way. It's, it's been quite a huge debate, I mean, from Peter Craig or up to several of the thinkers, but as far as I know for the time being, the only real substantial, let me say, investment that's been found was this 9 million uh, euro uh, that that uh, a credit that uh, uh, Marine Le Pen took from uh, this uh, uh, Czech, it's interesting, Czech or Russian bank, if you remember actually, uh, that was working in Switzerland. And it's the only the only uh, real, how should I say, trace of the money that somebody found out actually that Russia has been really doing wrong. I mean, there's a lot of, of course, there, there are direct contacts and so on, but not really. Uh, 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 visible strings of the money which you could see, for example. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned the portals and uh, other kind of uh, 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 Russian influence and that there's a lot of that, like the other woman uh, used to cooperate very, very closely with some of the Russian uh, guys. I'm not sure if he's doing that anymore and so on. But what I wanted to ask you according to this is, uh, uh, you, you didn't mention uh, a possible relationship of these, let me say, especially populist uh, uh, parties with the British. Because uh, what we have, uh, don't forget that actually after 2010, the first thing Cameron did that he entered uh, the party was to split EPP 
and to open uh, Europe of uh, reform and democrats as a subject which was more Eurosceptical. So could you uh, find some of the traces of, let me say, British influence to especially populist or, let me say, no more, uh, I'm not sure for the far right, but actually Farage influence and so on. That would be interesting if you didn't mention that. I don't think there are any relations uh, with the Farage party. I think it's only like influence in the, in the terms of ideology. In terms of if they have a Brexit, why not have a Chexit, right? And uh, even like the Conservative Party is like, oh, like, talks about it. And it's an issue which is like a, amazing to have an issue like Chexit for, for Conservatives, which, which they let the country into the EU, right? They were the ones who signed the treaty. And, and now they're like you know, playing tricks with this. So as far as I know, there are no relations with the Farage Party, but it should be accepting of the ideology. But in, in that sense, no, that, that, uh, you, you're right about the, the uh, public discourse and so on, but generally, as you know, Vassal Klaus, as he doesn't have any connections with Russians, so never had. He's a very popular figure in USA, in Britain, and so on and so on. Yeah, and I think the only connections <coughs> are like to, to, to Germany, right? right? Because um, there are like, uh, um, yeah, I think the only connections are really to Germany. Uh, Klaus or other? Klaus, um, Klaus, Klaus. No, no he's, he's great uh, uh, hero of Cato and uh, oh, yeah, Emmanuel well, right, in right, America. Yeah, you know, right, yeah, it's, yeah. it's basically. Yeah, yeah. America, yeah. So, so I think this, this new way, especially after British, after Brexit, mm -hmm. I think that we might see more of that, uh, uh, even with some future direct links, because I think, especially with very strong, I think, uh, anti German sentiment that's going to be rising. Yeah. So it's also yeah, something yeah, that yeah, should be yeah, yeah. followed. And I don't know, I'm finishing with, with the, the last thing. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Speaking about Victor Robert, uh, he, he started as something which you could call like economical reorganization. In the sense that he officially proclaimed that he wants like 50% of the market, uh, banking marketing to a market to return, to be returned to the hands of the uh, 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 Hungarians uh, that he is uh, almost officially supporting uh, uh, development uh, and uh, taking over of the uh, like big market space from the Tesco and the Carefo and so on and so on. Do we have something like that in, I don't know, Czechia, Poland or, or Slovakia? Like this, this kind of, uh, let me say, uh, how would you put it, like economic populism, this was that is playing within the, the, this... Uh, I'm uh, not scale. aware of anything like that in the Czech Republic, no. In Slovakia, no. No, it's not. And Poland, I, I don't know. It's more pro-market yeah. still. Mm -hmm. Czech, Slovakia, yeah. especially, and also. Yeah. And Poland? I'm not aware. So it's always strictly connected with the, with the country for the land. So, and I, I will finish with Moravian identity. You, you mentioned that actually, uh, uh, as far as I know, that some of the last censuses, there, there is like possibility to proclaim yourself as a Moravian, as a specific identity. Could you, uh, could, could you comment us about, could it be a new problem of the ones that we have at the Balkans, let me say, new identity? Uh, <laughs> I I am a Moravian, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't consider myself to be Moravian. I consider myself to be I don't know European or whatever. I consider myself to be a, a mother, uh, you know, whatever. And um, my husband does consider himself to be Moravian. For him, it's really a big issue when in the newspapers they talk about the Bohemians, not about the the Czechs, the, you know. And it's like, and it always, it always picks on these things when they don't, they, they talk about Bohemia and not about Czechia uh, and these stupid little things. So there are people, and uh, so I know this community exists. They, but the um, uh, funny thing is that uh, he actually became a, a member of the Moravian Party, which initially they strive for uh, some, I don't know, federation, confederation, whatever. But now they are strongly pro European and they don't ask for this anymore, they're kind of very liberal and very multicultural party and they just want to you know, have the affirmation of the identity, Moravian identity. So uh, I, I don't believe there could be a problem out of this in the future. Okay.
they, they try to input on the part of the electoralists every second one of the woman. They are trying, so the social democrats are trying to, to, you know, to, to be gender balanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, ODS, the Conservative Party, uh, they don't really care the national conservative women should stay in the kitchen, right? And, uh, um, the Green Party, yes, they do. They, they are a leftist party, so it's uh, uh, the, the, and the other parties. Um, I'm not really. I, I'm not. I don't really know. Uh, top O9. They didn't really have women in their roles. That's like significant women. Uh, actually, there's a number one in ODS now. Uh, she's Serbian, and uh, um, and she's very tough. National Conservative woman, and uh, she will, she was very uh, yeah she's number now actually now she's number three after after the past of year she's in Prague. Um, conservative party. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in Conservative party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. No, just, just finishing. Um, yeah, I don't know really what to. I mean, like you have uh, in some of the Balkan countries, you introduced gender quotas, and I think it was under the EU pressure or whatever international pressure, like Macedonia and Bosnia. But we don't have gender quotas, and uh, it, the lobbying is not enough to introduce gender quotas because there are many women who are like uh, within the political parties who are opposing gender quotas because they don't think it's fair and they don't see the reason why there should be gender quotas. And be introduced to the electoralists or within the party ranks. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks for this question. But what, what appears to me um, actually um, more interesting is that in the in Western Europe, uh, as well as in, uh, in, in Western European far right wing and conservative parties, we actually have first of all a high number of yeah, female voters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And secondly, also leading figures like Italy in, in Germany, even if they are contested, maybe this is a, of course also the fate, so to speak, of, of women. Yeah, they are put in the front, into the front because they are far right nationalists, whatsoever. Uh, even chauvinist uh, um, rhetoric is a bit um, softened sometimes, or doesn't come through, get, doesn't get through as as uh, aggressive, maybe. Yeah. Um, and of course. Uh, uh, Le Pen and etc. Et so my question actually would be, uh, and we also see see this in Austria, uh, the majority of voters of the FPÖ are women. I mean, or the, the, the rate of, of voters of the FPÖ are more women. Um, uh, so I don't know how the is still male. Uh, the electorate in all the Western countries is like, like predominantly male. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you, I mean, in, in extremist parties in, in Czech Republic, there are women, but in these radical right parties, the like the ones I mentioned, mm -hmm. I, I am not really aware of any like significant mm -hmm. women playing some significant role there. But in extremist parties, there are. Mm -hmm. like, but they, they, they were either outlawed, there was an extremist party which was outlawed, so they set up a new party, so there are women that, yeah, just there. Mm -hmm. okay. Do we have more? Okay, thank you very much. Sir. It's really more than.